And as we have announced, um, tonight we're stud starting a study on deacons, and we're using as our text for convenience Alex Straub's book called Paul's Vision for the Deacons, Assisting the Elders with the Care of God's Church. There is not a lot of information on the subject of deacons, and Alex's book is probably one of the best. Why are we talking about deacons now? Well, I think that it's important to answer that question because it wasn't just pulled out of the air. Um, a couple of months back, the trustees, uh, with the support of the elders, began a reevaluation or evaluation of our chapel bylaws. They're getting a little old, and we're just looking at ways those ought to be uh, enhanced or revised to protect the assembly and. Uh, facilitate our function. And one of the uh, questions that brought up again, it's not the first time, but it brought it up again, and that is, what is the relationship in terms of organizational structure for the local church? What's the relationship between what the church, what the scriptures teach and what the state requires? For example, not really an example, just an explanation. Um, the scriptures identify two uh, groups of officers or officials in the local church. The first is elders, and we're pretty familiar with who the elders are, what their qualifications are, and what their function is in the local church. But likewise, the scriptures talk about a group known as the deacons. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the words in a moment. So that's what we have on the scriptural side. On the legal side, if we can call it that, uh, the state of New Jersey requires nonprofit corporations to have a group of, of people known corporately as trustees, but that specifically lists that every such corporation, corporation shall have a president, a secretary, and a treasurer, as well as any other such officers as are prescribed by the bylaws. And if you're really interested in looking at that, that is uh, New Jersey, Title 15A, Chapter 6, Section 15A, colon 6-15, right? So we've got elders, deacons, and trustees. Well, how do churches, assemblies, integrate those two sets of uh, officials? Well, here at Belmar, traditionally, we have simply said, oh, the trustees are our deacons. I know of another assembly that approaches it a little differently, and per the bylaws, whoever the elders are, are also the trustees. And I'm sure there are other ways that it's done. Um, it's handled in different ways because I think it's a, a, a significant question. There are different ways to approach it. Well. Here are a couple of interesting questions. Or really sort of the core question is, are deacons and trustees the same thing, the same group? If they are, why do we not apply biblical criteria to the selection of trustees? We don't. Now I'm not suggesting that any of our trustees are not qualified to be deacons. But I know of one trustee who says, who believes he's not qualified to be a deacon. If they're not the same, what do we do? What, what should, should, should we change, if anything? Well, these are the kinds of questions that we uh, want to answer for our assembly as a whole. And it seems like the best way to get things started is by looking at the scriptures, right? And that is where we should always head first. And so, well, let's see. Sometimes it's about the opinion of the first question. There we go. Well, So we have a series planned out. This will be running for a number of uh, 
Thursday evenings for the balance of September and then into October. And we're going to divide the study up into three sections. Part one, is, which is what we're going to deal with tonight, and that is what are the biblical starting points? What's the foundation that scripture gives us regarding deacons on which we will then build our subsequent studies? Part two will be a look at overseers and deacons and the reason we're looking at those together is that the scriptures do integrate or relate those two groups very closely and in important ways. And then the third part, we'll be looking more specifically at the deacon's qualifications, uh, at their examination. And if you don't quite get where that word is headed, uh, you'll know a little bit more by the end of the evening. And then also the rewards for faithful service as a deacon. So that's where we're headed. If you don't have a copy of the book and would like one for your personal reference, there is a sign-up list on the bulletin board in the foyer. Uh, please add your name there. We'll order copies uh, for those that are interested. So, some background information. We've got two Greek words that are going to play largely into our study. The first is episkopos which is the word that is translated in various places in the New Testament as elder, bishop, and overseer. And all three of those words are used to describe those that we commonly call our elders. I don't know about the other elders who are here. I always get a little uncomfortable being referred to as a bishop. Something seems wrong about that title, right? Like I ought to have some sort of fancy headdress or a robe or something like that. I think I'm more comfortable with the word overseer because it describes the ministry uh, that is assigned to this group. We typically use the word elder, and I think we're pretty well as a group comfortable with what that group is and does. And then the next word we have is diakonos, which is really the focus of our study, uh, and that is transliterated into English as deacon. That's just a, you know, a migration of a word uh, into the English language in a similar form. It isn't really a translation. It's a transliteration, they call it. Um, but that same word in Greek, elsewhere in the New Testament, is ref, uh, uh, translated as servant and also as minister. Uh, because the translation of the word is that a deacon is one who renders service to another, or one who ministers to another. And that points out that the word can be used in reference to a specific group of individuals, which we shall see, but it can also be used as a general, in a general way. For example, in our study of spiritual gifts, we noted that a number of those gifts find their full maturity in service to others. And in that sense, as that gift is being exercised, it's appropriate to refer to that individual as a deacon. So there are different ways the word is used, and we'll have opportunity in our study to look at those. They are very closely associated in a number of ways. So we need, we're gonna to have to refer to elders and what we know about them to fully understand what the uh, what deacons are and what their role is in the local church. And then we need to look at two other things, two sort of keystones here. And one is uh, the Apostle Paul. Why? Because Paul is the only New Testament writer who uses the word diakonos, deacon. He's the only one. Now, some of you will probably then quickly think about, well, what about Acts chapter 6? Um, uh, written by Luke, of course. Well, I do believe that that account in Acts chapter 6 of the recognition of a number of individuals to help with the ministry to the widows and other needy people in the local church, work that was distracting the elders from the ministry of the word and of prayer, I think that is a description of the first recognition of deacons, but the word's not used. So a little bit of a technical point there, but Paul is the only one who uses this particular word. And Paul is also one of our primary teachers related to the recognition and ministry of elders, although not exclusively so. We find ministry from other of the New Testament writers in terms of that subject. 
But when Paul is talking about elders, which he does in a very authoritative way, he speaks about deacons in the same authoritative sense. So we see a parallel there between elders and deacons that's really quite important. And we want to remember that Paul speaks with apostolic authority. He was not one of the original 12, but he was an apostle recognized by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in due time in that series of events, really, that began with his salvation on the road to Damascus, right? So this is the, the teaching we have from Paul regarding deacons is not a group of suggestions. It is instruction that is to be followed, just as we do in respect to the elders. The other thing we want to note is that uh, 1 Timothy is a critical book for understanding this topic. What was Paul's favorite church? Or which was Paul's favorite church? I'm not sure it's a fair question to ask. But you can certainly look at the scriptures and say, Ephesus, if it was not his favorite, it was surely up there. And if we go into the book of Acts, we find that Paul committed an enormous amount of ministry, personal ministry to the founding and, uh, and cultivating of the church at Ephesus, more than three years as I recall. And if we turn to Acts chapter 20, which was the last time Paul had face-to-face -face contact with the elders of the church there, he sent for them from Miletus, they came and visited with him, and in Acts chapter 20 we have this wonderful rendition of Paul's encouragement to that group uh, of elders, and he says, you know what? You're not going to see me again. This is the last time face to face. And I implore you to care for the church of God over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. overseers. So he was committing the care of this assembly to these men. Right? Well, after Paul's departure then, over a period of time that we can't really pin down, the church at Ephesus went downhill to the point where Paul was not able to return himself to help deal with the problems, but he was able to appoint one of his closest associates, Timothy, to go there and rebuild the church, to deal with problems, which really came into two categories. One was false teaching, and the other was that relationships within the body had disintegrated. A couple of years ago, we did it a study on 1 Timothy, and we gave it the title, How to Behave in Church, because relationships are so important. And so 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy were the letters that Paul wrote to this man who was caring for the assembly that was so very dear to Paul's heart. And it is in 1 Timothy that we find the key body of instruction related to deacons. We'll see that in a moment. So, enough um, introduction. We're now going to quickly go through a number of the broad areas of scriptural instruction relating to deacons. First, we want to note um, that the first time they are mentioned is in the book of Philippians. In, and just once, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, bond servants, of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now Paul's habit, if you go look at his other epistles, was that he would write to the church of God who was at Corinth or to all who are gathered in Rome. And he almost always uses the word saints to describe those individuals, but the letters in almost every case are addressed to the church as a whole. In this one case, he adds a specific address to the bishops or the elders and the deacons. Why does he add that? What's the point in adding that? I don't think it's an afterthought. Paul was providing important instructions to the church of Philippi, and it's as if he's identifying these two groups of, of people and saying, you have primary responsibility for making sure in your position as leaders and ministers 
and servants in this particular place on doing what needs to be done in the local church. So that's the first mention of uh, the word deacons. Then we go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, which is, as we mentioned before, um, where we find key teaching regarding deacons. And I want to read just a couple of verses from 8 to 13, because this is the center portion. He's just talked about overseers or elders. Now he's talking about deacons. Verse 8, likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So this is the instruction that Paul is giving to Timothy so that he can see that it is fulfilled within the church of Ephesus. And I think what we need to understand, both from the fact that he's ministered on elders, we didn't read those verses, but also deacons, is that the correction of problems in the local church in this particular case, required, required strong, godly leadership. And I think we have to conclude that if that strong, godly leadership had existed over a period of time, the church wouldn't be experiencing the problems that it's faced with, right? Leadership is critically important. So we have these specific, whoops. If I skip and forget to advance, just wave your hands at me. So we have these specific instructions found in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. Next, we want to note that deacons are always mentioned after overseers. There are two places in Philippians 1, 1, and in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 13, two passages we've read, where Paul mentions both elders and deacons together. And when he does that, the elders always come first, the deacons afterwards. And I think that that sequence is significant, and it tells us that the deacons work under the direction of the elders. Of course, as elders, they are overseers of the church. They have that global responsibility for guarding the flock of God, ministering to it, teaching it, etc. cetera. Uh, and the deacons, in that general sense, fall under that area of responsibility, but it seems there's a little bit more here, right? We have these two groups linked together, elders first and then deacons. So there's an association that we see uh, building up in this content. Uh, in our text, um, the author notes that elders not, do not need the deacons in order to function. An elder can guard the flock of God, can teach without other people there as assistants. But the deacons don't really have a role separate from the elders. I think we'll see a little bit more of that as we move through our study. The next thing we want to note, and we read this just a moment ago, is that deacons are required to meet certain specific qualifications. Here's the list. It's what we were just read. Now, depending on what translation you use, you're going to find slightly different wording but the sense is always the same. Known to hold the mystery of the faith. Absolutely sound in their salvation. No question about whether someone is of spiritual mind or not. Tested first and proved blameless. There's a test to pass. They are dignified. Not double-tongued. Not greedy. Not addicted to wine. Husband of one wife. They have wives who are faithful in all things. And then they have children and households that are managed well. I think for any of us, if we said, what kind of leaders would we like to have? This would be the list, wouldn't it? For 
So there are these specific qualifications, and we're going to get into those as well in our study. The next thing we want to note is that deacons are not required to teach. Paul very clearly states that the elders or overseers must be able to teach. That's found in chapter 3 and just a couple of verses before the portion we read. And in his letter to Titus, he adds that they must also be able to use sound doctrine in order to exhort. In other words, that's not just general teaching. That's teaching that really is driving home to the individuals. And also to rebuke. They have to be able to use sound doctrine to rebuke error. But those qualifications are listed for overseers, but they do not appear on the list of the qualifications for deacons. And that at least suggests to us an important distinction in ministry between the elders and the deacons. That elders are required to teach, but deacons are not. It's not that they aren't able to teach or would never teach, but that's not their, the focus of their ministry in the local church. Then we have the fact that deacons must be examined and approved by the church. That was in verse 10, which we read. But let these also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons being found blameless. Now, if we put those in sequence, we have you get tested first. The result of that testing is that you're blameless, and then you get to serve. And the way this is, its position here in this, in this instruction tells us that this is a really serious process. It takes some effort. It's not a casual thing. Um, one of the stories in our text is about a, a woman who said to a, a, a pastor or a leader in the, in, in the church, well, you know, so-and-so, he hasn't been coming out to church very much. Maybe if you made him a deacon, it would give him some incentive and he'd come out more faithfully. And the idea was that you don't become a deacon in order to get you to become spiritual. Spirituality and commitment to the things of God comes first. And then for at least some of those in that situation, recognition as a deacon follows. This process we fo follow is, now this is personal commentary, is one of the areas where we handle where deacons, the appointment or recognition of deacons, is different from how we handle trustees. How are trustees selected? Now, I'm not suggesting that it's a casual thing. In fact, our bylaws require the trustees to give a list of suggestions for new trustees or renewed office to be submitted to the elders in advance of the annual meeting so that we can, have, can weigh in on those selections. But I'm sure some of you will remember at our annual meetings where you, you, you know, uh, nominate that slate of officers and then there's what comment? Are there any other nominations from the floor? Right? And I can't pin down exactly when it was. It was quite some years ago. But I remember a nomination from the floor and thinking, wait a minute, where did that come from? That person has no business being a trustee. Right? And yet, that kind of suggestion from the floor is completely in line with state law regarding the operation and, and appointment of trustees in the local nonprofit corporation. So that's a case where I don't think we've ever had. That person I mentioned didn't get elected, so, you know. But um, there's a seriousness about the process that we find in scripture that is simply absent on the legal side of things. Next, we want to note that deacons are church office holders. We just spent a couple of weeks going through spiritual gifts. That's not where we had ministry about deacons. This is separate ministry. Um, and they are always discussed within the same context as church elders. And we know that elders are a specifically recognized group 
with specific qualifications, specific responsibilities in the local church, and it's and we, un we should understand deacons to be the same thing. These are officials. These qualifications are completely separate from salvation. They're separate from exercise of spiritual gift. Someone can be faithfully exercising their spiritual gift in the church of God and yet not meet these qualifications. And so I think it's proper to recognize these as identifying specific office holders. They're part of a recognized group. We're getting toward the end. Deacons, when Paul uses the word, he always uses the plural form, never singular. And of course, he does the same with respect to overseers or elders. And as we discuss elders and their functioning in the local church, we, we, we point at Paul's use of the plural, he's not the only one, um, to argue that there, are all, there should always be multiple elders in the local church. It is never a one-man ministry. And the same can be said of the deacons. It's not a one-person uh, kind of a deal. Certainly, the way Paul uses the plural form here, it certainly allows for multiple deacons in a local church. I think it probably goes a little further than that. Uh, and uh, maybe not so far as mandating it, as I have on the slide, but at least encouraging that. Next, we note that deacons' wives have specific qualifications as well. And speak to any elder you wish, any of us, and we will tell you that our ministries are nothing without our wives. In fact, I think we'd probably all say that our ministries as elders are enhanced by our wives. And I think we can all envision the problems that would arise if you had someone who was a godly man seeking to, to function as an elder in the local church, but you had a wife who was either unsaved or um, had, had you know, sort of left the faith, not in fellowship anymore. There's just something wrong about that, right? And the same is true when we're talking about deacons. Now, note the second bullet point. Some, and I don't mean some as in a few, but a, a, so a significant number of expositors believe that this verse is not talking about the wives of deacons, but is talking about female deacons or deaconesses. And we do have the word diacono, uh, diakonos applied specifically to a woman. So it raises an interesting question, and that is, can women be deacons? That's an important question. We've played around from time to time with the question of whether or not women should be trustees. I think we, we talked about that in relation to Jane Walcott when she was doing most of the treasurer's work, and she'd have nothing to do with the idea. You know, that was anathema. And I believe uh, Deanna has had, has had similar words, although I'm not sure. You're nodding your head. So, um, but these two women and their reticence doesn't answer the question for us, right? So this is something that we're going to look at in our study. And then the final thing we want to note tonight is that the scriptures are very clear that there are blessings that accrue to the individual who functions as a faithful deacon. First, there's good standing or influence within the church of God, certainly. This is, we're not talking about some servant who functions in the background and is never seen, never thanked, never acclaimed, not slave, but someone who through their, someone who through faithful servant gets some measure of stature within the assembly because of their faithfulness. And then the second thing, and I think these wording, the wording is faithful here, but they achieve good standing and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. It's as if their faithfulness and effectiveness in serving as deacons uh, brings spiritual growth and boldness into the picture. They become a different kind of person or they mature in a different way directly related to their service. This is a recap of just the basics related 
to deacons uh, in the New Testament church. Next week, we're going to start talking, I think we've got two, maybe three weeks, talking about the relationship of elders or overseers and deacons. So that'll be the next piece.